talking about it for the third day and thank you for Peter and Sam last night. Um, thank you for all your many blessings on this pastor and the work that you're doing with us now. Thank you for the Holy Spirit for the final sermon and pray for Elder Jeff to be good for us. Pray that you help us to keep up with your word tonight. We pray that Angel and Peter has spread the food that we've committed and I pray that you help us to get the word out of our mouth and to it. This is just a uh, few quotes about Ezekiel 2 and 10. Sister White's clear that Ezekiel 2 and 10 lines up with the revelation of John. It lines up with Isaiah 6. Um, but it's addressing what we're dealing with in these lines of prophecy that are coming out at the midnight cry. These are the wheels within the wheels. So let's just read through this so we can consider that's what's happening. The sixth chapter of Isaiah has a deep and important lesson for every one of God's workmen. Study it with humility and earnest prayer. The first and second chapters of Ezekiel should al also be carefully studied. The wills within the wills represented in this symbol was confusion to the finite eye. But a hand of infinite wisdom was revealed amid the wills. Perfect order is brought out of the confusion. Every will works in its right place, in perfect harmony with every other part of the machinery. So what we're saying is the three months is a will, the seven churches is a will, the 120 days is a will, the 70 days is a will. They're all interconnected. Uh, the fractals are wills within wills. I mean, that's a, a really nice way to describe it. They're wheels within wheels. And when you look at it, it's confusion, confusing. But where do you look at it? That's how you look at it. Where do you look at it? Where is Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 2 and Ezekiel chapter 10? And where is Isaiah in Isaiah 6? The most holy place. You're in the most holy place when you're looking at this. Brother Michael, next paragraph. Loud because we don't have a roving mic. Pot? Uh, the, uh, the notes are online. I, what do you, this is, I didn't trace this down. When I pull up quotes and I'm cleaning it up, this isn't cleaned up, I'll get the most common one. What is CHL? Christian Living, page 26. But there's a more common place where you can find this. I'm going to stand close to you so that people can hear what you read. This is from Testimonies, Volume 5, page 751. Ezekiel, the morning exile prophet in the land of the Chaldeans, was given a vision teaching the same lesson, lesson of faith in the mighty God of Israel. As he was upon the banks of the river Chebar, a whirlwind seemed to come from the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof was the color of amber. What, what is this? This is the wheels with the wheels. No, what's, what's coming out of the north? Like a whirlwind. The king of the north? Uh -huh. You think this is the king of the north, huh? This is the true king of the north because the king of the north is a counterfeit to Christ. But it's interesting because the line upon line show us what's going to happen, which is the final movements of the king of the north. Yeah, that's interesting, but this isn't the papacy. Yeah. Keep going. A number of wheels of strange appearance intersecting one another were moved by four living creatures. High above all these was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps. It went up 
and down among the living creatures. The f and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And there appeared in the cherubims the, four, the form of a man's hand under their wings. Sister Karen, loud. There were wheels within wheels in an arrangement so complicated that at first sight they appeared to Ezekiel to be all in confusion. Are these lines all in confusion? At first sight. At first sight. But when they moved, it was with beautiful exactness and a perfect harmony. <coughs> Heavenly beings were impelled, Pelling. impelling these wheels, and above all, above this glorious sapphire throne was the eternal one while round about the throne was the encircling rainbow, emblem of grace and love. Overpowered by the terrible glory of the scene, Ezekiel fell upon his face when a voice bade him arise and hear the word of the Lord. Then there was given him a message of warning for Israel. Who else fell upon his face and then rose up? Yeah. Isaiah, same story. Yeah, but uh, Daniel also. Next paragraph, Sister Christy. This vision was given to Ezekiel at a time when his mind was filled with gloomy uh, forebodings. 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 He saw the land of his fathers lying desolate. The city that was once full of people was no longer inhabited. The voice of mirth and the song of praise were no more heard within her walls. When was the vision given to him? given to him at 9-11. Was the, was the Seventh-day Adventist church lying desolate at that time? Yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. The prophet himself was a stranger in a strange land, with boundless ambition and savage cruelty reigned supreme. That which he saw and heard of human tyranny and wrong distressed his soul, and he mourned bitterly day and night. But the wonderful symbols presented before him beside the river Shabar uh, revealed an overruling power mightier than that of earth, uh, earthly rulers. Above the proud and cruel monarchs of Assyria and Babylon, the God of mercy and truth was enthroned. So these things he sees are symbols. And symbols always have a figurative meaning. Sister Madison, loud, loud, loud. The wheel-like complications that appeared to the prophet to be involved in such confusion were under the guidance of an infinite hand. The Spirit of God revealed to him as moving and directing these wheels brought harmony out of confusion, so the whole world was under his control. Myriads of glorified beings were ready at his word to overrule the power and policy of evil men and bring good to his faithful ones. In like manner, when God was about to open to the beloved John the history of the church for future ages, he gave him an assurance of the Savior's interest and care for his people by revealing to him one like unto the Son of Man, walking among the candlesticks, which symbolize the seven churches. So what did she just do? She said John had the same vision as Ezekiel. And we've already seen he had the same vision as Isaiah, but what did she just do beyond that? She's saying the wheels within the wheels are the histories of the seven churches. She's identifying the seven churches as the wheels. He's having the same vision as Ezekiel and Isaiah, but what he's seeing is the history of the seven churches, the history of the seven seals, the history of the seven trumpets. So those are Ezekiel's wheels within the wheels. While John was shown the last great struggles of the church with earthly powers, he was also permitted to behold the final victory and deliverance of the faithful. What's that? No. The external and the internal. She's saying in these wheels within wheels you have the external, the earthly powers, and you have the internal, God's people. Two primary themes. Where are those two primary themes emphasized in the book of Daniel? that we dealt, we used to deal with it all the time in this message, but we don't deal with it very much anymore. What's the symbol of external and internal in the book of Daniel? Sister Tanya, answer that for us because this is one of the things that you like the most. Mara. The Mara and the Chauzon vision. The Mara is the vision of Christ in the most holy place. That's Isaiah, Ezekiel, and John. 
but the Chao Zone is the history of the kingdoms of the earth. So the Mare and the, and the Chao Zone. Yes. He saw the church brought into deadly conflict with a beast in his image, and the worship of, of that beast enforced on pain of death. But looking beyond the smoke and din of the battle, he beheld a company upon Mount Sinai with the Lamb, having instead of the mark of the beast, the Father's name written in their foreheads. And again he saw them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, <coughs> having the harps of God, and singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Okay, all of that was Testimonies, Volume 5, page 751, 752. Now we're going to read from Education, page 177, 178. Sister Tamina, loud and clear. Upon the banks of the river Chaba, the sister beheld a whirlwind. That's not very loud. <coughs> seeming to come from the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. And a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof was the color of an ember. A number of fields intersecting one another were moved by four living beings. High above all these was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of the statue of stone, and upon the likeness, the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it, as there appeared in the cherubim the form of man's hands under their wings. The speaker one. 27, 10 in verse 8. The wheels were so complicated in arrangement that at first sight they appeared to be in confusion, but they moved in perfect harmony. Heavenly beings, sustained and guided by the hand beneath the wings of the cherubim, were inclining these wheels. Above them and above them upon the sapphire stone was the eternal one, and round about the throne a rainbow, the, the em emblem of divine mercy. As the wheel-like complications were under the guidance of the hand beneath the wings of the cherubim, so the complicated play of human events is under divine control. So what is the wheel-like com combination, wheel-like complications? Human events. human events. The complicated play of human events. The seven thunders are what show us the events, right? So the complicated play. Amidst the strife and tumult of nations, he that sitteth above the cherubim still guides the affairs of the earth. The history of nations that one after another have occupied their allotted time and place, unconsciously witnessing to the truth of which they themselves knew not the meaning, speaks to us. To every nation and to every individual of today, God has assigned a place in his great plan. Today, man and nations are being measured by the plummet in the hand of him who makes no mistake. All are all are by their own choice deciding their destiny and God is overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. How many times is the plummet mentioned as the plummet in the King James Bible? Three. Three. Okay. And what are, what's it represent? 25, the 2520. So they're being measured by the 2520. That's why when we do the combining of the, the last seven kings, that's an illustration that comes from the 2520. Brother Tyler, loud and clear. The history which the great I Am has marked out in his words, uniting link after link in the prophetic chain from eternity in the past to eternity in the future, tells us where we are today in the, pro in the procession of the, the ages and what may be expected in the time to come. All that prophecy has foretold as to come to pass, as coming to pass until the present time, has been traced on the pages of history and we may be assured that all which is yet to come will be fulfilled in its order. So what are these complicated play of a human events? The the earth, They're the wheels within the wheels, but in that last paragraph, what are they? The links. They're the links <laughs> in the chain of prophecy. What did Miller, what was Miller led to recognize by Gabriel? The commencement point of the chain of truth. But what's opened up to us at the end of the world, when we move into the most holy place at 9-11, is the links of the chain, which are the complicated play of human events, right? Okay. 
Does Jesus illustrate the end from the beginning? No. So, this is 508. What's 508? When's it end? Let's put it that way. It ends in 538? 508 marks a time prophecy of how many years? 1290 and 1335. 1290 and 1335. Let's deal with the 1335. When's it in? 1843. What is 508 that is also 1843? Because this is the beginning and this is the end. What, is, what does 508 illustrate that takes place in 1843? What was 508? Taking away, the daily. taking away the daily. That's one of the things it was. What history was it? Clovis, it's not Clovis. Clovis may be in that history, but Clovis is marked in 496. You guys are close, but what history is this? Where, what's John see? That is the, lo the links and the complicated play of a few minute fences. What's John see? The churches. The churches. What church is this? Thyatira. Okay, it's Thyatira. <laughs> Get to the back of the class, my brother. Is 508 Thyatira? It's Pergamus. When's Thyatira come in? 538. Okay, so this is Pergamus. What happens in Pergamus? Falling away. Uh, falling away. You redeemed yourself. You can move back to your original it's chair. Falling, <laughs> falling away. So do we see in 1843 a falling away? The Protestant churches fall away in 1843. What is 1843 in this sense? It's a symbol of the first disappointment. All right, they're predicting the end of the world in 1843. When 1843 doesn't come, there's a falling away of the Protestant churches. Right, everyone see that? Um, so this is the beginning, there, there's probably more that happens in this beginning that, illust that took place in 1843, but definitely 508 and 1843 are marking a falling away of Pergamus, uh, the Protestants. Right? You would you would mark that at the arrival, when the disappointment happens, and it's at the arrival, that's where the second angel arrives. That's where the second so angel arrives. Is fallen, is fallen. This is fallen. what? 4 1844. Okay, but it also begins the 1290, which takes us to where? So from 508 to 1798. What happens? What? What happens here and here? What are the beginning and ending histories? There's probably more characteristics than one, but I want to get it down to one. The removal of maybe. Yeah, the, it, it, it's first off, 508 to 538, that's what you're talking about. This is a history, this is a preparation. Why is it a three-step? Why is 508? No, pardon, pardon me? It's 30 years, you want to put 30 years up there? Do we ever see 30 years? It's preparation. 
Okay, so, but let's go back up here. What happens in 508 that happens in 1798? Paganism is removed, but papal, papal, okay, that's, that's a valid, paganism taken away, papacy taken away, but that's not what I'm looking for. Who does it? The king who, the, who is this? Roman. You're almost there. Who's he the king of? France. Okay, what's France? A two-horned power. This is a two-horned power, and this is a two-horned power. This is an activity of a two-horned power. The two-horned power puts the papacy on the throne, takes the papacy off the throne. The, what, uh, what's the thing that what they historically meant the marks, by the way? It's the, is it the Battle of the Visca? Yes. Okay, and that's, that's by Clovis. That's by Clovis. So... Um, we need to see <laughs> how 1798 and 1843, I'll put this out here. These are two endings that have the same beginnings, 508. So, What's the beginning in 508 that illustrates both 1798 and 1843? What's that called? A horn removed in... A horn removed in... What horns removed in 1798? Is he a horn? A little, a little horn. What horns removed in 1843? Yeah. Protestant horn. So what horns removed in 508? Pagan horn. Okay, so there's a horn removed. So, what are we seeing here? We're seeing that 508 illustrates not only 1843, but it illustrates 1798, and you can show it from a lot of different ways, right? Okay, so it begins a time prophecy that comes to here. What, what is here? 538. Okay, and then it also comes down here. What's 538? Okay, papacy. It's the removal of the third geographical location. Papacy empowered. So what is this in our history? Sunday law. Is it? Did, did the papacy pass a Sunday law in 538? Yes. 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 Justinian passed one, passed one, passed one in 321. That's back here. But when the papacy took control of the world in 538, they passed a Sunday law too. There are two, Bible, two Sunday laws in Bible prophecy. The first one is passed by paganism. The second is passed by papalism, thus typifying that the first one is passed by the United States and the second one is passed up, placed upon the whole world. This, this is the world Sunday law. Yeah. 321 is the Sunday law in the United States. That's a different story. That, well, that's what I was just going to say, because it's the conquering of the third geographical location, so it would, it would make it Egypt. Yes. So that, that's why I said, is it? But is the papacy empowered here? No. Yes. This is 538 is typifying the conquering of the United States. So from 508 to 538, we have a preparation of 30 years. Anyone want to add anything to this before we move to the next step? If in this sense that 538 typifies this, the conquering of the United States, then we have a horn being marked as taken out right here at 508, so that could be the first day of the first month in some Ah, there we go. He hit, it, he hit the nail on the head, and I didn't have to walk you through the logic. 508 is 911. Based on the horns? Based on a, a variety of things. 
Well, also 1843 would be the arrival of the second angel's message, and if that's paralleled by 508 because of the beginning and the ending, then you have two witnesses marking the 1843 is, is April 19th, 1844, and April 19th, 1844 is 9-11. Everyone see it? And 538 is the Sunday law. The, so this is? 30 years. We get another number on <laughs> Is it? Is it 30 years? Yeah. It's also a fact number. Then that would be Christ's birth. No, no, don't go anywhere about here. Yeah, it's also everything. This is the <laughs> wheels within the wheels. So from 9-11 from to the Sunday law, how many way marks do we have? No, I mean, I, I mean that we. Did the, what are the major waymarks that have been opened up by Ezra seven nine? There's a waymark right here. And at the at the broad level, this is the first test. This is the second test. This is the third test in that history, right? Yes. So this probably would be the f ten years, twenty year, twenty years, thirty years in terms of years, right? I'm not trying to make anything, but I mean, the 30 years, pretty easy to break up into the three tests. But what's this way mark? Midnight cry? Is that history? I don't know. It's the midnight cry. What is it, what have we been identifying this as in terms of the second test? Image of the beast. Image of the beast. Image of the beast test. What's the image of the beast test? Yeah, that's the visual part, but what is it? What, what is it actually in history? It's the, yeah. it's the coming together of church and state, the beginning of it, with the church in control of the relationship, right? So, in 508, the horn is removed, 9-11, at the Sunday law, the papacy is placed upon the throne. This evidently is the image of the beast test. Where is this in this history of 508 to 538? Okay, what happened? Uh, well, that's a different line. W w w Michael said this earlier. What is this? In 538, the what happened? The third. It's a three step, and Brown said it too, but should, neither one of them were getting what I'm going to say here. In 538, in the history of the papacy, the third horn was conquered. What was that? With the Goths. The Goths were driven out of Rome in 538, right? So at one level, there's this is the end of a three-step testing process, and, and Adventists get confused because they think 508, you know, is like the second horn or the first horn, but the horns are different than 508. The other horns are, are removed, the last one's removed here, but this is the, the third step in this history. So, where do we see the three steps in, in this history? Revelation, Revelation 13, 2. Okay, so here's where she takes the throne, right? The dragon gives her, him his power, his seat, and his great authority. What's his power? So when does, when's it given to him? Uh, well, in this history, the power is the one that is a progressive giving. And it began with Clovis in 496, but it continues all the way through. So the power is given to him in this history when is the power given to him in our history? What's 496? 1989. 1989. Ronald Reagan is Clovis. 
But this process of giving it to him, what happens at 9 11? Patriot Act. The, the, the strength. What does the papacy do in Daniel against the Most High? He speaks great words against the Most High. This is, this is the strength of the papacy, is he speaks. And what's the speaking? It's, the it's, his, it's his laws. His laws is how he speaks. And at 9-11, the Patriot Act identifies that his power has fully been given to him. But he's not, a, he's not on the seat yet. He's going to get on the seat at the Sunday law. Full power, so he's been given the progressive power, the second power. Yeah, see, they're in charge at 508. We don't understand that, but it's true. Uh, in, in what is this for the Millerites? In the Millerite history, what is this? 1843. And what happened in 18, for at the conclusion of 18, and I, on April 19th, 1844? The Protestant horn is fully given to the papacy, but it's not, it's not manifested, it's not demonstrated till 1022, 1844. What are the Protestants doing there to manifest? They're praying to Satan, They're praying to Satan but they were conquered by Satan back here. Yeah. The United States is conquered here. The papacy has the power of the United States right now in 9-11. Placed on the seat here, What's, what's it lack? The great authority was just the decree of Justinian. Ah, the decree of Justinian in 533. Oh, that's wow. What is that decree? It identifies the Pope of Rome as the head of the church and the corrector of heretics. Now, when the Pope of Rome becomes the head of the church and the corrector of heretics, what does he become? Church and state. He's in control of church and state. This is the image of the beast test, the midnight cry in advance of being seated. Um, other times we've marked 330 as the seat because Constantine moved the capital to Constantinople. Uh, I understand the seat being there because it makes sense, but what was, you see what my question is, like 330 would be the seat. So why is 538 the seat in this sense? He has to have the fact that he is given Rome back here in 330 is meaningless until he has power and authority to rule it. Okay. He's here he's seated upon the throne. He has the authority that is the ten kings. Okay, the the civil authority the legal jurisprudence, and he has the power, the military mat, might to uphold it. Uh, in 330, he had neither. All he was given... Was the place where he would rule from when he had power and authority. Yeah, so okay. what's 330? I mean, when did, he, when did he get seated? Probably 538 in this history. He's been sitting there, but it was all his power and authority were taken away in 1798, but he was still sitting there, waiting to be restored. So, what it, Sister White says, concerning the Sunday Law in the United States, how does she say it? She says it begins in the United States, that's not her words, and she says, but the same test will come upon all our people in every country of the globe. So it begins here, but every country on the globe follows the example. Though she leads out, every country on the globe will follow her example. What's her example? What's the example of how the, pa the United States gets conquered by the papacy? It's this here. It's this here. Because the image of the beast test concludes with the mark of the beast test. Okay, so for the world, for the world, not for the United States, for the world, what is the Sunday Law? First 
Yeah, yeah, that would qualify in terms of the manifestation of the, the Holy Spirit for the world. This is the midnight cry for the world. But in the testing process, the <laughs> mark of the beast in the United States is what for the world? It's the image of the beast <laughs> test for the world. And it goes one at a time. After the Sunday law hits the United States, the people in Mexico are going to look at what's happening and they're going to realize that in their country, now there's a movement to enforce the Sunday law in their country and they're suddenly under the image of the beast test in Mexico that concludes when Mexico passes the Sunday law and so on and so forth down to France. You know, when it all comes to a conclusion. So this time here is an image of the beast test that's progressive. Image of the beast test, here's the mark of the beast in this country, this country, this country, this country, this country, and it finally reaches a point to where what happens? There's a world Sunday law that includes what? The death decree of Bible prophecy. What's that? That's 538. Okay, this is the Ten Kings. This is Egypt getting conquered. This is why you, you can't separate this history here, the dynamics of the image of the beast test leading to the mark of the beast test. It's, it flows all the way through. That's why when she conquers the United States, she's conquered them all. It's, it, it, that's why you, you can't separate verse 41 and 42 of Daniel 11. When the United States gets conquered, Egypt's getting conquered at the Stop. very same time. It's dominoes. Okay, so do you see some wheels within the wheels? Why is 538 down there too? Because 538 is a symbol of the mark of the beast. And this is the world, oh, okay. the world Sunday law. But when the world finally all, all comes under submission to the Sunday law, they will have went through a process, country of, by country, of being tested with the image of the beast test. Are we going to allow our country to come under this principle of the combination of church and state with the church and control of the relationship? They'll have that same testing process that starts here in the United States. Their wills within wills. The, the United States, this is, uh, this is pretty ironic, I guess, like, uh, because the United States was the first to really separate church and state and have a constitution that did such a thing. And many countries since then have followed our, followed the United States and making a constitution and having it basically the same as ours. <laughs> so then we flip around and go, no, actually we want church and state to be combined. And they follow us right into the hole. So really this here is 538. You see that? Uh, is it also 508? That's what I was just gonna. That's what I was just gonna yeah, say. Okay. This is 508. So that's a, like a fractal. Yeah. Does does 508? Uh, we did. We showed that the beginning 508 and 1843 were the end, and the beginning 508 and 1798 were the end. Uh, and we showed the connection between 1798 and 1843, the endings with 508. But we didn't discuss is five, 508 slash 538 beginning, ending, beginning, ending, what's the same? Is there a same? We've already discussed it. Well, what's 508, this is an activity of who? Mm -hmm. Two horned power, France. What's 538? Activity of France, two horned power. Drives the Goss out of Rome. Okay, two horned power in both instances, activity of two horned power. So 508 and 538 are an activity of the two-horned power. What are the two-horned power? Clovis here. What is the two-horned power? Clovis, in France, in, read Revelation 11, verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. The, the two nations or powers that are France are Sodom, and Egypt. 
and they here they're doing the work of starting the preparation for putting the papacy on the throne of the earth and her, here they're putting the papacy on the throne of the earth. And for 538 starts a 1260 year prophecy that ends in 1798. This being the beginning, this being the ending. What's the, how does 538 Typify 1798. 200 power. Okay, so, so this is France, but the USA, what two horns are they? Okay, so which one's Protestantism? Sodom. Sodom. Which one, of course, it's just by elimination. Why is the state Egypt? It's an atheistic state. Yeah. Pharaoh, a symbol of civil government. So what justification do we have for bringing the two horns into it? What are the two horns doing in 538, 508, 538 that are illustrating 9-11 and the Sunday law? They're placing the papacy on the throne of the earth. The army of God. It's, 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 they're the power that's, that's placing the papacy on the throne of the earth. Who takes the papacy off the throne of the earth? Okay. The two horns. It's always the two horns. The ten kings are going to burn her with fire. But the ten kings, that's the United States. The, it takes her off? Yeah. Okay, where, where do you see... Who typifies the papacy in the scriptures? Who is the pa in, the, in the terminology of Daniel 11, who is the papacy? The, the king of the north. Who brings the king of the north to the throne in earth's history? First. Who's the first king of the north? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. What brings Nebuchadnezzar into history? Why does Babylon get brought into history? That's, that's how God uses it. Right here, there's a preparation. There's going to be a preparation for Babylon taking control of the world, is there not? Because there's always a preparation for Rome taking control of the world from either... 508 to 538, or from 911 to the Sunday Law. There's a period of preparation, and that is 30 years. So when Babylon came to the throne, there's going to be a 30 year, and don't look for history because I don't think this is correct. It's not 30 years. But this is Babylon taking the throne. When, she, when did she take the throne? Six oh eight. Okay. How did she take the throne? She destroyed Jerusalem, right? She destroyed Jerusalem, right? You guys, are, yeah. at first it seems complicated, yeah. but all it is is the human events. All right. So just step out of this for a minute. We're talking about the first king of the north, Nebuchadnezzar, the first king of the north. I know that Assyria was the king of the north. But the first king of the north that is typifying the Sunday law, he conquers who in 608? God's people. And, and what's God's people that he conquers? Close. Judah. And Judah is what? It's a two horned power. It's the glorious land. This is Judah. And Benjamin. Right? Yes? Yes, it is. This is the glorious land. Is the glorious land in the time period of Zedekiah? This is Zedekiah right here, right? Is the glorious land made up of two nations? Yeah. What happened to the other ten nations? 
They're already gone. This is Judah and Benjamin, and these two horns are getting conquered here. But why are they getting conquered? What brings Babylon to the throne of the earth? You all know this. Wow. I'm thinking some, but I'm not sure. Look up Hezekiah. How many, a after Hezekiah was going to die, how many years were given him? 15. Okay, 15. I was thinking, boy, if it was 30, that would be profound. But it's not. Okay, it's 15 years he was given. This is Hezekiah. Half of 30, yeah. So what did Hezekiah do? He was supposed to die here. Is, he, is Hezekiah the king of Judah? He's the king of a two-horned power, Judah and Benjamin, and he's supposed to die in, in 508. Okay, is, is pagan Rome going to die in 508? Yeah. yeah, but Hezekiah is not going to die for another period of time. But what does the Lord do? to confirm well, that he's going to... Yeah, but what's he do? He moves back the sun. Okay, so what's that do? It stimulates the curiosity of the Babylonians to find out what's going on in Jerusalem. And what do they do? They come to, And what does, what does Hezekiah do? Okay, he, he shows him his kingdom, right? What's a kingdom? The state. He shows him his state. What was he supposed to show him? His, his God, all right? His church. That's the motivation for the Babylonians to coming to conquer. What do, in the scriptures, when Nebuchadnezzar conquers Jerusalem, what's he do? He takes all the gold out of the temple because they've been, they've been drooling about it since back here. It's always a two-horned power that brings Babylon or the papacy to the throne of the earth, but it's always a two-horned power that takes her off. Who took off Babylon? The Medes and the Persians. You see that? So the two-horned power is a symbol that runs through the scriptures, and this is what lets you know that, among other things, that the head of the ten kings is the United States. Yeah. It's, the, it's the ten kings that are going to destroy the papacy with fire and eater flesh. But the king is the symbol of the kingdom and the king of the ten kings is the ships of Char Tarshish. It's the United States. So when the United States is getting conquered here, is Egypt getting conquered at the same time? Yes. That's why it's verse 41 and verse 42. You just very rapid history. There's a, there's a battle between the, uh, the little horn and, and between David's horn, the horn of David, right? I was wondering if there was another horn, a godly horn, that fights. Because Mark applies the Medes and the Persians as the 144,000 at the end of time. I don't know if you agree with that. Or with that. I was wondering, because there's that spiritual battle that goes on, and it happens to be that it's between two horns. I don't know why we're dealing with Mark, uh, Mark's thoughts here because it's outside the scope of this, but this is so typical. So I have to explain something that Mark is teaching in here when we're in the middle of this. Okay? Yeah. So right here the horn of David is anointed. Right? And it's going to do battle with the little horn in this history. Okay, but the little horn is the threefold union of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. And you're arguing that because Hezekiah was a two-horned power, and because Zedekiah was a two-horned power, and because David's little horn is the horn of, of Judah, it's a two-horned power. So if the horn is anointed here, where do we see two horns? Divinity and humanity? Really? I was thinking at the Sunday law, there's a second group of people who are anointed. Really? The Where's the second horn come into this history? At the Levi. Yeah, the yeah right Levi. here. What is, what's the second horn? Church. 
<laughs> this is the joining of the, the sticks. Of course, they're only one nation. It says they're only one nation. And Judah was only one nation, but it was Judah and Benjamin. And da the house of David at the end is only one nation, but it consists of the first fruit offering and the harvest. It consists of modern Israel and the 11th hour workers. And they're the Medes and the Persians because the Medes and the Persians here, when they destroy Babylon, what do they do? Who's the symbol of the Medes and the Persians when they destroy Babylon? Alexander the Great, huh? Cyrus. And what does Cyrus do to destroy the Babylonians? He, he dries up the water, but he goes in through. There's a gate that no man can open that's been opened, and he comes through and he slays it. Who does that? Christ. Christ. On October 22nd, 1844, and at the Sunday Law, there's a gate, there's a change of dispensation, and Cyrus typifies Christ in 1844, and therefore typifies Christ at the Sunday Law, and at the Sunday Law, the church triumphant is in place, so with both horns. So my thought was that it adds another witness to the fact that it's not just the two horns of the United States that leads the ten, ten kings to destroy the papacy, but also the papacy is destroyed spiritually by a two-horned power, so in every way it's destroyed by a two-horned power. Yeah. But the papacy is just one horn. Yeah. It's a little horn made up of three parts. It's an amalgamated So, what does this tell you? <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to pretend that I understand what it tells you. I'm just going to tell you this that just. So you see it, that there's external and internal. We know that, right? That's the churches and the seals. So when you're watching these wheels within wheels, you're looking for revelations about external activity, the kings of the earth, and internal activity, God's church. In the, this history, this is primarily external activity, right? But you have here, from 9-11 to the Sunday Law, you have 30 years. Which is what? How many years was it from when David was the anointed and when Yahshua became the king on the throne? I have no idea. Well, you know, kind of a two anointing, not anointing, but I mean two classes because he was anointed when he was younger, then he actually became king when he was older. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure, but yeah, he got anointed again. Oh, come on. For those of you on the DVD that can't hear what she's saying, she's trying to suggest that maybe the 30 years from 9-11 to the Sunday Law might also represent what we were looking at yesterday and the day before about 30 days of mourning. She's trying to say that maybe a day is a year. Where would you come up with a concept like that? Uh, yeah, it's probably, no doubt, a day for a year, that seems like a no-brainer. 30 years, 30 days. The way these wheels are coming together, yeah, because there's a mourning that goes on in this general history, okay? But it it's really goes on in here, more specifically. Yeah, and this is the this is the the ceiling of the hundred and forty-four thousand begins right here, right? That's Ezekiel 9, but we now understand that it really comes into play right here, more specifically. Don't we? Okay, so yeah, I would think the 30 years is the 30 days. I would think the 30 years is also representing the three tests in this history. But it's probably more to do with the external. Comments? So, this here, let's just, I'm realizing, and I'm sure all of you are realizing this too, that um, we can't keep moving through this. As the Lord's opening up these things, we can't just keep moving forward as I, and just following it. 
Okay, you, you have to follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. But I'm realizing that two camp meetings ago when we came to understand the 120 years, that before we knew it, we were into the 70 days. And before we knew it, here in this last camp meeting, it's the three months. And the line of the tribe of Judah is opening up these things, and as he opens them up, we run along and we try to catch up with them, but we're not taking time to look at the details of it. But as we went back just in this past couple weeks and started looking at the 120 things that we'd already noted, but we were going into them and we're starting to think about them and, and try to draw out all the implications that it, there's just all kinds of stuff there, and we need to be doing that. So this 100 and 120 from here to here, and this 70, at the end of the day yesterday, probably after the mic was off, Michael brought up something which, we are, which is already known. Um, I'm taking this off so to try to clear, it up. clear up our visual consideration. Yesterday we, <coughs> how was it, we, we seen a the morning, we're talking about the, th the 30 years, the 30 days of mourning in here for Moses and Aaron, but we realized that there was a 70 days of mourning for Israel. But the first 40 days was the embalming process. And I, we're assuming that when you're embalmed, you're permanently fixed for eternity. When you get to this 40 days, this is the midnight cry in this fractal. Those people that have either been embalmed for life or embalmed for death. And then this remaining 30 days of the 70 is a whole nether issue. But, but what Michael brought up here at the end, this 40 days is what? It's the embalming. We got that. It's the embalming. Could be the wilderness test. Ah, the wilderness test of Christ. So, pardon me? I'm talking about 40. So it's the wilderness test for Christ. What else is it? Moses, here at the end of 40 years, he's going to take the work into his own hands, and at the end of the next 40 years, he's going to be in submission to the Lord, thus giving an illustration of the wise and foolish versions right here in the first two 40-year periods of Moses' life, right? But he's going to live another 40 years. He died right here. Okay, so if Moses died here, what is this to here? It's, it's three steps, it's three, three sets of 40 days. Three periods, three tests. The Egypt test, the, the body. It's 40 test. years. Oh yeah, 40 years, yeah. What is this? this? Yeah, but what happens here? The Lord comes down out of heaven. Right? At the Red Sea, did the Lord come down out of heaven? Yes, he's the, the pillar of fire that came down. So this here is marking the beginning of the 40 years of wilderness wandering. At the end, Moses dies. He dies when he's 120 years old. So the 40 years of Moses is the 40 days of Christ fasting. It's How many times did Moses fast for 40 days? Two times. Two times. There's a brother in Canada that will tell you it's three times. Have you looked at it closely? Well, you have to be able to prove it. I'm just saying, have you looked at it closely? You got a fasting of Moses here and Christ. Three, three fastings. Are we supposed to be fasting in this history? 9-11. Okay. You got Elijah fasting for 40 days, but you got the 120. So 
from here to here is 120, and it's connected with Moses. That's how old he is when he dies, but you also have Moses in the wilderness for 40 years, so Moses is teaching more than one thing in two different periods. Now here's the point that I want to throw your way. This 120 then is the 40, yes? Mm-hmm. It's a lot of other things. So what's this 40? It's the 120. Which makes the 30. What happens at the end of this 120? The midnight cry. What happens at the end of this 120? The midnight cry. So what is the midnight cry? It's the second. This is the third. This is the first. This is the third. There's a second in here. And this is the first. <laughs> this wheel here, this wheel here, now let's, let's say it this way, this wheel here of the 40 and the 120 and the embalming, this wheel here, yeah. it's part of this wheel. Yeah. But this wheel here is this wheel. Mm-hmm. And this wheel here mm-hmm. is this wheel. Yeah. And this wheel here is the same process of the 11th hour workers. And from here to the close of human probation is a wheel. This is first, second, third. What's the point just once you can start seeing all these wheels that you can be seen? What is the point? What is the point? This is, a, this is, this is, uh, I, I, this is, uh, this is what I wanted to get to today. I wanted to raise that question so we could answer that. But I, there is a, not, not philosophically off the top of our heads, from prophecy, what does this do? See, now you guys are philosophizing. Give me Give it to me from the word. We've read it today. Yes, he's all those are truths. But who illustrates you and me today? Ezekiel, Isaiah, and John. So when they see this, what happens to them? They're humbled into the dust. Yeah, but I, I, it's that's I want to see the the prophets illustrating this experience. I, she says that he gave him an assurance of the Savior's interest and care for his people by revealing to him one like the Son of Man walking among the candlesticks. So we're being revealed this, and we're like, okay, okay I, yeah, I, I'll tell you, there's there's. I'm at the point personally with me, where. I know, I know a person that, that uh, I don't think they're up to speed with the prophetic scenario, but they're not at the level I am. And I'm not lifting myself up, I'm just trying to make a point. But I do have confidence in their, their soundness of their, their, their mature understanding of, of Christianity and whatever. And, and for the past few days, I'm thinking, I'm going to go sit down with this person. I'm going to say, look it. Is this will, 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 this will. I'm seeing all these wills. This person is seeing some of these wills, but not seeing, they're, they're not in this class. And, and I'm going to say, I'm going to ask, do you think this is fanaticism? Or do you think this is genuine? But well, all I'm saying this for is, It's getting to the point with me, someone that has dealt with these truths for years and these principles, that it's so overwhelming at this point that if it's not causing you to think, if to internalize this, saying what's going on? I mean, this this isn't about the it is, but this isn't the last six verses of Daniel 11. This isn't an argument about the true or false position on the daily. Okay, this is at a level of the line of the tribe of Judah bringing the whole Bible into one verse, Ezra 7, 9. 
and the effect of every vision takes place there. And if you think you can stand back and watch this take place and, and get it logically, oh, okay, I get that, I get that, and I get that. If it's not taking you into the dust, showing you, starting to question who and what you are, then you're one of the foolish virgins. Because a foolish virgin could, can be watching these things on the DVD or sitting here in this class and have the mental ability to get this concept and put it together. But if it isn't making him ask, why do I have the privilege to be seeing these things when virtually no one else in Adventism is seeing them? If that isn't humbling you into the dust, then you're not receiving it in the right fashion is what I'm saying. Because I've had the ability to convey, I have the ability to convey prophetic principles to an audience where they may not be able to get up and teach it right after the presentation, but most of the time, like it or not, the people that are opposed to what we're doing, they'll, they'll, they don't want to admit this, but most of the time, if you could ask somebody right after they heard a prophetic presentation that I've done, did you follow the logic? They'll say yes. Okay, they, they, they'll say yes, even if they're fighting against it. They, so what I'm saying is I've had to been given the ability to lay out the prophetic logic well enough for people to at least see there is something in it behind, beyond the human level. But as I look at this, I don't know how to teach it. It is so big. And every time you try to get back into it to say, okay, where do I, where do I, if I'm going to teach it, what's my starting point? And you go back in there and say, well, maybe this is a starting point. And you start looking at it, and it continues to grow. <laughs> There's other wheels within wheels. You say that you're, you're realizing human being can't do it. Can't do it. On the last page that we read today, it's on Education 170.2. that to every nation and to every individual of today, God has assigned a place in the That's philosophical. But it's, it's in a way, it's true because look who's handling this world within a will, like a four beast. Right? Yeah. And I don't know if you remember, I mean, I, Uriah Smith points out that these four beasts, these four living creatures, represent something. Just like the 24. Oh, yeah, without a doubt, the four beasts represent something. Yeah, I, I get that part. You're, everyone has a part to play. What I'm saying is... How do you write that in a newsletter? <laughs> how do, that's, that's my point. How do you write this in a newsletter? How do you stand in front of God's people? The, the notes that we sent ahead for the European meetings, I, that's old news. <laughs> okay, it's old news. You've got to go back there and, and go back so far back in time of what's unfolding and teach that you have to do it because they haven't been up to speed with the other stuff. But that is the divine element in this, I'm thinking. And if it isn't humbling you in the dust, then you're missing the point. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I think I've seen clocks like that. Okay, so let me let me share one thing that I thought about to try to make. I wanted to get to this point today, and we did. And you may not know what the point was, and it's not a major point. I just wanted to. You know how you take a mirror and you put it in a mirror and another mirror, and it creates this to infinity. If this 40 days from this 70 days morning, if this 40 days of embalming is lined up with this 120, then how was I going to do that? It goes on forever. Yeah, it goes on forever. <laughs> it does. It, 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 but how, so in this 40 day, in this 40 days, okay, if you've got 40 days here, 
And never the, another story. I don't know how to portray how this, these fractals keep going downward, but they do. I had it figured out this morning, but I lost it. Bas basically, you take this. This one? And stick it there. Yes. Like you have it. And then you would take it again and divide. And you just keep dividing. And Div keep writing I the 40 and the 30 and the 40 and the 30, but you can't even write that small. Because if you could divide two Yeah, but you, okay, so why, what's your justification for putting 40 and 30 in here? There, there. Your your thirty right there is the seventy. Yeah. If that's the one twenty, then that thirty is the seventy. You just put nine eleven to the Sunday law in that whole thing. Why is the thirty the seventy? Because thirty and forty. Because this thirty the between the midnight cry and the Sunday law. Oh, that's it. That's it. This thirty here. This thirty is a morning. This is a thirty. But this produces a 30 here. Mm -hmm. right. And then you can, which is hard going down. down. So maybe you need to start labeling the numbers. Yeah. 30s are always, um, they're mornings, they're definitely. Are they 30 bad. days or 30 years? No, our 30s. Yep. We can list them up. Let's well. start labeling what they represent. <laughs> right. It's kind of like the metric meters. system. It's Pardon me? It's like the metric system. You've got one meter. And you've got okay, one go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. Get it figured out for us. <laughs> And, and ex explain it. I, I, I get your point. That's what I think too. You got to label them. You got to put them in order. But where do you begin with something like this? See, because what I was talking to you about yesterday, I was thinking, well, if you're on a really big scale, you need to you need to see it this way, and in reference to these five points or whatever, you need to see it this way in this perspective. But if you zoom in, it needs to be seen this way. And if you zoom in, it needs to be seen this way relative to what position you're in. But what you were saying is, well, uh, this goes here because of this. And so now you see that the 40 is there, so all of the 40s line up there. So what's the argument against this? When the Adventists that are fighting this message hear what we're saying in this class over the past few days, what will they say? You can't, you can't have it. <laughs> no, they, they'll, they'll, some of them will say, oh, this, I, they've always said that. It. Well, they'll say it doesn't sanctify They'll say you can't learn it. It's unimportant. But what will they say about us? No, they're going to say we're crazy, we're fanatics, but what they're going to say is now they're taking every passage of the scripture and using it any way they want. They're, they're putting this passage of the scripture over here and over here, and all they're, they're forcing the scriptures just to uphold their preconceived ideas. That's what they're going to say. They're already saying that. What would yeah. even the idea be? Yeah, but we're giving them fuel for the fire now, all right? Why, why, why do you, isn't that question a lack of faith? Yes. It sounds no like way. It's this not is a lack light. of faith. This is light coming down. No, she, I don't think that she's denying that it's light. I don't think she's. How do you prove I, I asked that question not for that answer, okay? I, I, I really don't think it's a lack of faith. I, it, you're, she's answering my point. Is if you're looking at this and it isn't forcing you to go home and make it your own and confirm it for yourself, then you're there for the wrong reason and you won't be able to stand. You have, the line of the tribe of Judah in this history will prove to you that he is the one that is doing this, but he cannot do it if you don't begin to eat the little book for yourself. So these messages have to bring the right experience. Yeah, and that, that includes self-examination. It includes an acknowledgement that you're a human being will it, that can make mistakes and be led astray. So your, your two comments were not, they're the same, but it's on a different level. I'm going to try to say what I was trying to say. In I one I'm minute. One minute, okay. Depending on what scale you're at, there's a certain truth that's being taught, that's specific that you need to understand. And so on a big scale, you need to learn that Christ is doing work in the heavenly sanctuary. If you zoom in, you see that he's cleansing his people first. If you zoom in, he sees that you're, he's cleansing the present truth believers first. And you can zoom in, he's cleansing you right now. But at each level, there's something that's being taught specifically that would be addressed. But what we understand, because of the pattern, 
and it's only a three-step process always, we understand that at every level, the same things can be paralleled at the one, two, three. So you can have 508 at the big level, you can have 508 at 911 and so on. You can keep going down and put it at every level if you want because it's a pattern, it's a practical, it, it makes sense, it can be proved. But at each level, there, it, the way that I think about it is that there's something specific that's being taught that we need to grasp out of that. Because we can keep putting it all the way down to infinity, but we may not get anywhere by keep lining them up forever. There's something that, there's a reason why the, the lower levels, the lower level fractals are giving secondary and tertiary yeah. witnesses to the big picture. We are to learn the big picture. We're going to so fully understand the big picture that when we come to the Sunday Law time period, uh, we, will, we will be God's spokesman yeah. because he will have cleaned up our mind, but it will be based upon bringing all the witnesses that there are of this way mark into existence, all here, all here. This is rooting deep. This is what the, the, the plant has yeah. to root deep. We're going deep. And it sometimes seems like, oh, why, how are we doing it? How is this doing anything? It's, we're just getting, okay, I'll just put that there now. You're almost getting like a mocking spirit. And I, I don't know if you feel this way, but I've gone and been like, oh, and there we go. We're back at the 120, clear down four levels. What, what do we do with that? You know, but... Well, one of the things that I have th in the past week I've recognized is, and I mentioned this yesterday, and, I, and I'll end with this, is that we know that there's the foolish virgins that they're portrayed in the scriptures as the enemies of God. Okay, there's certain classic enemies, King Saul, Nadab, and Abihu, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. But now I'm starting to see that the Lord is identifying exactly where these enemies, Nadab and Abihu are here. Okay, you can put them over here in a general sense because they're generally the foolish virgins and the enemies of God. But he's starting to put even the, the bad, he's putting them in such a clear place. And once they're in that clear place, then you can derive the, 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 the specifics about what's happening in this history. The, the fractal, the fractal is, is the, the essence of the three angels' message. Yep. Okay. Uh, who prayed to start? Brittany? You want to pray to close? Sister Tanya? Got to pray loud or they will not hear it.